Recording is on, and my therapy session is over. <laughs> well, necessary venting with the uh, pseudo-human contact. This is the Wheel of Time Spoilers podcast. So are we doing this? Are we talking about Matt? We are talking about Matt. And Oliver. Oliver. This is our second Oliver chapter. Yes, this is the chapter in which Oliver is adopted by the band. Mm Mm-hmm. Because last time it was like, yeah, yes, I would just get you adapted real quick. And then this is the chapter where Oliver's like, no, 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 (laughs) no. I'm living with the band Mm -hmm. now. All right, before we start this chapter, I want a one-word answer to a question. Okay. Who killed the uh, Who killed the Tinkers? Uh, ah, wrong. <laughs> That's not the word I was looking for. You suggesting Aiel? I'm I'm curious. I want to know what you think before we talk about it. I have never come up with a satisfactory answer to what the hell this massacre is about. I don't think it's okay. the Aiel, but I don't know who I think it is. Agreed. I have a theory. I went back and forth over this chapter. Probably three or four times to come up with it, but I think I'm satisfied with it. Is it Chalvan? But that's my tease. <laughs> <laughs> he ate all the horses. That's why they're missing. <laughs> right. Okay, whatever. Uh, no. I've got a theory. It could be bunnies. This is an interesting chapter, though. A lot happens. I mean, story-wise. We introduced Chalvan, and we have the Tinker Massacre. We have... The Gateway I Yell attack. We have Oliver joining the band. It's not a lot, but it is a lot. I say that every time. I need a new way to describe these things. I'm not even going to get what I don't get. How about that? You know, I, I have mentioned Buffy more than a handful of times on the podcast. So there is a certain... The, you know, in, in a lot of ways, I feel like there's a certain overlap. It is a epic fantasy with a focus on characterization. Like... I don't see any reason why Wheel of Time fans wouldn't also love it. Okay, okay, I'll watch it. Jeez. Just twisting my arm. Uncle. So bunnies. <laughs> why don't you, like, title this chapter and read us in like a podcasting adult? Because I've been drinking. Chapter 22, Heading South. And our symbol is the Lucky Dice. The Matt Dice. For Matt and so the it's band. definitely a Matt chapter. <laughs> yeah, and the band's heading south from... It's heading south down the river Aranin, making it look like it's a, going to attack Tyr and Semael. Yes. So that's the heading south. Right. Also, probably all their plans are heading south in a more metaphorical sense. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> uh, in a handbasket. Heading south in a handbasket. Yes, quite. The five stones made a smoothly spinning circle above Matt's pans. One red, one blue, one clear green... The others striped in interesting ways. Which, by the way, I have something to say about Mm. that. He rode on, guiding Pips with his knees, the black-hafted spear thrust behind the saddle girth on the opposite side from his unstrung bow. The stones made him think of Tom Marilyn, who had taught him to juggle, and he wondered whether the old fellow was still alive. Probably not. Rand had sent the gleeman herring after Elaine and Nynaeve what seemed a very long time ago, supposedly to look out for them. If any two women needed looking out for less, Matt did not know them. But no two were more likely to get a man killed because they would not listen to reason. Nynaeve poking into everything a man did or said or thought and tugging her bloody braid at a fellow all the time. And Elaine the bloody dotty air, thinking she could get her way by sticking her nose in the air and telling you what for, as bad as Nynaeve ever did. Only Elaine was worse, because if frosty, high-handedness failed, Elaine smiled and flashed her dimple and expected everyone to fall down, because she was pretty, too. But he would not mind if they had found themselves in a pickling kettle at least once since scurrying off to the light new air. Let them see what it was like without him to haul them out, and never an honest word of thanks when he was there to do it. Not too hot a kettle, mind, just enough to make them wish Matt Cawthon were around to rescue them again, like an idiot. <laughs> I love Matt's internal monologues. That is definitely one of the most lovable Matt inner monologues, I think, of all of them. Mm -hmm. That is just like, because it's such a genuine gripe. (laughs) He's like, if any two women needed less looking out for, it's those two. But when you are there, they ain't going to say thanks. That's for damn sure. Yeah, it's it's so sarcastic. And Mm -hmm. yeah, it's 
I love it. But at the same time, this is Matt being like, I'm never going to rescue them again. Mm-hmm. As he runs in to rescue right, them. Right. You know, like, it's, yeah. It's like, mm-hmm. and I mean, we see that later in this chapter when he's like, I needed two strides. <laughs> two! And then instead he hurls himself into a meat grinder. And it's like, Matt, Matt, you will always rescue people. We see you, Matt. Mm-hmm. Okay, so the red, blue, and green stones. Yes. So I have to, this is entirely coincidence, but today on Reddit, someone was reading Eye of the World and posted about Tom Marilyn's juggling stones and the order of the colors in which he juggles. Oh, really? And I was like, what? And I like this theory. Okay, I'm listening. Okay, so in the original Eye of the World, Tom picks up a red, white, and a black stone and begins to juggle them as the first three. The red, red, white, and black represents the three colors of the dragon banner and the three Taviran. Okay. He then takes out a blue stone, which represents Moraine, showing up in Emmons Field. He then pulls out a green stone, which is Egwene joining the party. And then he pulls out a yellow stone, which is Nynaeve <laughs> joining the party. What? Yeah. Holy shit! And he just, he puts the Ajahs right there. Blue, well, green, Wow. Yellow. Wow. That's damn RJ. I read that today and I was like, you know, that's, I mean, not a necessary interpretation, but those colors have like, they're just too significant, right? Like, yeah, no, that's not random. That's not random. Mm -mm. And, And why he's juggling so many anyway. And so here we have another reference to Tom and here we, I had to look at the stones. Like I literally, literally saw that article on Reddit today. So I, I mean, it was like, Oh, one red, well, the red one would be Matt of the original red, white, and black. Mm-hmm. One blue and one clear green. I don't know. This is where I'm trying to like make analogies. I'm trying to make the blue and the green one Tom and Moraine. And the other one, Noel. And the whole rescue of, I think it's a stretch. I tried to do something with it. I don't have anything for this one. So work with me on this. Uh, well, okay. We've got his three Band of the Red Hand guys. Are in this chapter. Okay. We've got Tamanus, Darid, and Nelesian are all in this chapter. And the others are striped in interesting ways. That could be the rest of the band. Sure. I'll stretch with you. I'll stretch. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Yeah. Let's. Well, I'm just saying, like, the colors, colors are so meaningful in the Wheel of Time. And especially with, like, seeing that today, I was like, I like that theory about Tom's thing. But yeah, <laughs> Ogier's like, these all sound like stretching. Okay, fair enough. This is this is me as your English teacher being like, so is there meaning in these colors? <laughs> Maybe the drapes and, and are And Jordan's just like, <laughs> right. And he's like, dude, I literally named all the colors of pretty rocks that he could have picked up and thrown. That's it. The, like, I will say. White, black, red. Put yeah. my broken earth hat on for a minute. Uh, clear green? Not a super common kind of rock. There's not a lot of. Jade? clear rocks clear minerals there's a few but i mean a clear green pebble is not exactly a common occurrence it's probably like well because he'd recognize an emerald because he's matt sure and maybe he means like the more like opaque kind of green where like you can see light through it but it's not actually like translucent i immediately thought of sea glass but i mean obviously that's probably not a thing well could be and i mean Blue is also not a super common mineralogical color. Oh, that's a good point. Oh, your tendency is saying that clear green could mean perfect green, not marred by other colors. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and also, they could just be painted stones. Painted? No. They're not painted. No. Oh, he picked yeah, them up. Yeah, he picked them up and kept them because he likes the colors. Gotcha. Like, as a rock hound, I can assure you, these are not painted. But now that you've got me thinking about number symbology, I'm going to choose to interpret this as his army of his three generals and the others that are striped in interesting ways. Also okay. the 47 scouts, because those guys are all of shady pasts. So striped in interesting ways. Mm. Right. So he's got his generals, the red one, the blue one, and the green one, and then his scouts. I like it. Okay. Because this is the chapter where we have the whole process that leads to Chelvanon. Ah, yes. The give me your most dishonest friends. Mm-hmm. It starts with seven and grows to 47. In this first passage, I noticed that Matt is thinking about, like, you know, where Tom went, and he went herring off after Elaine and Nynaeve, and we know that all of them are in Saladar now, and then on the next page, they're talking about the Aes Sedai rumors, and do you think it's true, and all of this stuff, and it's like, Mm -hmm. there they are, that's where Nynaeve and Elaine are, (laughs) ding dong. Right, 
right? Oh, nice catch. <laughs> More of RJ just rubbing your face in it. Right. I, I, I love it when he does that. Yeah. And I don't catch it. <laughs> I'm just like, do you smell that? Oh, that's a hint. Oh, man. I think I hinted myself. Oh, God, I gotta take a shower. <laughs> so uh, we get a timeline here. 11 days since they've left Mayrone, which we saw, we saw him pick up Oliver in Mayrone. And they're halfway to tier, or a little better, moving for nearly 45 miles a day. Bullshit. Yeah, superhuman. Yeah, I looked up. Google says that the average speed of a medieval army on a Roman road is 25 miles a day. So either miles are not the same thing, or horses are magical in this world. There's, I mean, obviously he's saying he's pushing them to their limit. Like, this is this is a heroic march. So average, assume already he's got some of the best equipped armies and his average would be closer to 30 and then he pushes it you know you get an average maybe up to 40 and if you're going crazy you can get to 45 i'm i can see that being possible skeptical. but in the same way that matt juggling six balls casually or five balls or six balls casually is something also not really humanly possible yeah. we suspend our disbelief uh in the possibility um of wheel of time the one power. It's it's the magic of plot. Let's go for, go with yeah. it. Yeah. Though I was also thinking that aren't some weights and measures are actually different? Like actually, the measurements are different. That is true. So th- these might yeah. not be our miles. In yeah. which case, I can also I suspend my disbelief a little bit more. <laughs> Wait, they're longer. <laughs> okay, now it's not helping. It's not yeah, helping. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, Sorry. moving past these details because I don't want my fantasy ruined. <laughs> <laughs> Super Skylake says it's the Tiberian. It makes them walk farther because Tiberian is pulling on them. <laughs> I like that. We're sure. going with that. Uh huh. Uh huh. Every step, it's like, oh, whoa, that, that that was a little bit further than I thought it was. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so they're traveling in this. I would almost call it the turtle and the hare message, where you have these different components of the army traveling at different rates, and so they travel for different amounts of time. Like the foot almost is walking for sixteen hours a day. Yeah, and the the wagons are taking even longer to catch up. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, I'm impressed that they can move at all, given all the different staggered speeds of what's happening. It does seem a little dangerous as well. Mm Mm-hmm. That, like, if you were to get attacked, your army would be kind of spread out. But I guess you have scouts. You have idle scouts making sure that... And you can leave a few guards, uh, right? Nobody's approaching. You can remobilize enough to kick some bandits in the teeth pretty quickly. Um, And ships are bringing... And they are walking along the river, so ships are carrying Right, they're going alongside the river, so. so that helps. Yeah, that does help a lot. So, five hired riverboats flying the band of the Red Hand. Four more were on their way back to Marone to reload. So basically, there there's this caravan of ships bringing supplies from Marone that seems really uh, to the army. I mean, but he's marching on the Dragon Reborn's orders. He's got it's true. The the yeah, he's this isn't uh, Matt's gambling uh, resources <laughs> providing valid <laughs> this is the, 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 this is country level army resources so yes i'm sure it is quite expensive and i i like the little competition that whenever the aiel like pass them it's like oh no we got to go farther because we don't want the aiel to be able to catch up to us this proving that the horse and the aiel can like out, try and outpace each other is what's pushing them to go further and further and further mm-hmm. good competition yeah healthy competition can definitely uh Get more done than working within what you think your limits are. So, speaking of limits, you ever think about what it would be like to be a warder and have your limits pushed a little bit? Do you like that segue? I thought that was pretty uh, good. Uh, what, that was good. That that was good. Yeah. <laughs> it's a hilarious conversation. Right. So Nielsen's asking Matt, like, what do you think what it would be to be a warder? Uh, what do you think it would be like to be a warder? And they're thinking that just because there's so many stories about Aes Sedai and warders and Aes Sedai pulling strings floating around. On the other side of the Aranin. So they're on they're on the Kyrianin side, right? Uh, Actually, I'm not sure. Which, which side of the Aranin are they on? Kyrianin or Andorin? Okay, where exactly are they? I've got my companion map open. But where exactly are they? Mayrone. So if you actually, if you're looking at the sort of in the front of the page map, mm-hmm. if you go tier and go up the river to Erangel, mm-hmm. Mayrone is literally the word right above Erangel. Huh. So essentially Erangel. Uh, Mayrone is the Kyrian inside of that. Oh, Ar- uh, okay. Of, uh, yep. So they are on Saladar's farther north then, yeah? Uh, Saladar is quite a bit further west. It's on a different river. Okay. It's in Altara, basically. Right. 
So you have to like get past formatting, get past Murundi, get past Ilian. Like Saladar's way the hell over there. Uh, so I'm confused then how they're on opposite sides of the river from each other. The Aes Sedai. Because we're talking about Aes Sedai on the other side of the Aranin. I assumed that those that was Saladar Aes Sedai. Mm, I don't think so. But that that doesn't work by the geography you just laid mm-hmm. out. So no, not at all. No, no, no. Because they're this these are um and either in Andor or, I mean, this is one of those areas that's not really claimed, right? Like, far we're kind of farm addings in this area, but these are the plains of Morado. There's no nation, right? We haven't crossed into Tyr yet. We've left Andor. But this is nationless territory. We've got Aes Sedai swarming, and I'm just so confused. Like, why are you swarming in the middle of nowhere? I assume they're traveling up the river from, like, either trying, probably trying to get out of Tyr and going up the river to Tarvalon. Because if you keep following this river up, it goes to Tarvalon. That's, that's fair. Yeah, heading to Tarvalon is very important at this point mm-hmm. for Aes Sedai. And the river is going to be one of the fastest ways to get anywhere. Huh. All right. All right. He meant the Aes Sedai on the other side of the Arnon, reportedly scurrying upriver or down a site quicker than the wanderers that were over there as well. I yeah, I have no idea. I assume it's just general Aes Sedai scurrying. Yeah. I was going to ask you about that because I, I honestly I wasn't sure what is causing the scurrying. Yeah, because it's... It, I always figured it had to be related to Saladar because, I mean, even got half Talman is saying, like, you know, mentioning this newer bit of gossip about Loghain, right? This new bit of mm-hmm, gossip that's mm-hmm. only two days old. So that made me think it has to be related to the effort Saladar is putting out. But I don't know why they would be scurrying up and down the river equally so far away from Saladar. I'm so confused. The only other thing is that they could try to be getting to either Kyrian or Camelin because both of those are also upriver on the Aranin. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's so many places. The Aranin leads to basically the rest of civilization. <laughs> it's like, it's what connects Tyr to, to everybody else. Right. Right. But except we know Tyr is under the control of uh, Semael right now. So like, why are Forsaken traveling between Semael's control and somebody else's? yeah yeah no this is a this is a big head scratcher for me i could not i was not i was like i don't know what i said I, he's talking about to be perfectly honest highlight it in a different color and everything where are we at with the timeline of the supergirls and saladar they're in saladar they've been in saladar the rumor yeah, for... is two days old to matt and the band but we have no idea how long saladar's been putting it out right we really don't know where they all are relatively at this point. Huh. I'm just trying to think if there's like some mission that the Aes Sedai go on at some point that that explains why he's seeing so many of them here. Yeah, it must just be general Aes Sedai running around trying to bring no... It must be... You know what it is? I bet it's them bringing nobles to see Loghain. I bet it's them mm. going out, finding nobles, and saying, please come with us and observe the happenings and Matt's and his band are only really noticing the eyes to die. They're not noticing the nobles as much because they're superstitious men, I guess. I don't know. That feels really weak. Uh, only because it's tied pretty closely to the rumors. That's, I can buy it, but yeah, that's rough. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, but we did know they couldn't go too far. We know they were going in the Murray and D and Ilian for nobles. They can't really go into Altara because you know, white cloaks. Or Amadicia, I mean, they can go into Amadicia. So, like, uh, yeah, I mean, maybe. It's just you've got this Plains of Morado between River Aranin and any other civilization. And they don't have traveling yet. Because they don't no. get traveling until Egwene shows up. No. So uh, the only the only travel has to be between Tyr and the White Tower or Tyr and Camelin or Tyr and Kyrian. Yeah. So, yeah, it has to just be the Aes Sedai trying to get their feet under them with the whole making Saladar a thing while they stall out for the little tower to figure out the whole Egwene thing. Hmm. Way to be obscure, RJ. I think your rock colors make sense, but then have this entire, like, movement of people <laughs> and places be completely confusing. <laughs> Very obscure. <laughs> uh, we get a line here that warders don't seem to sweat, so we know they've got the mental trick. I think we've talked about that I don't before. think they do. Because Matt's literally thinking of Lan, and Lan's just stoic. I don't think Maybe. we ever hear about warders like getting trained to not sweat. I think that's just Matt. 
See, I disagree. I thought we we did hear about mortars not sweating, and that's something they it, like we we speculated. You either had to like have some tie to the power to sort of master that trick. Huh. Like we. Uh, well, this is my speculation, right? Like, nobody who isn't tied to the power ever is capable of mastering that mental trick that we're aware of. Like, everyone who is tied to the power is like, oh, it's just a mental trick. And yet, everyone, you seem to have to be tied to the power, either as a warder or as a channeler. Well, in fairness, the only non-channelers we see think about it choose to not pursue the meditation because it's too close to channeling. Right. And warders, obviously, that wouldn't be a hang-up for them. So maybe they, hmm. Hmm. or maybe it could be a side effect of the bond because we know physically they don't seem to experience physical pain and stuff the same way. Yeah. I don't know. I think, I still think Matt's exaggerating, but yeah, now I'm just because Lance's example. Yeah. No, I'm not sure. Matt exaggerates about everything. It makes sense though, because everyone who is a channeler says it's a mental trick. Warders would be like the only people who wouldn't say no to learning a cool mental trick to make themselves more badass. If anyone's going to learn it, who can't channel. It's going to be warders. It's going to be the warders, yeah. And that makes them more mysterious. <laughs> but they're also tied to, you know, they also have this sort of like... Right, uh, like how with yeah. men, warders be- get visions around them by virtue of being tied to their eyes to die. Right, right. Even though they're not channelers themselves. In a, in a lot of ways, the pattern views a warder and her eyes to die as a single thread. Hmm. Certainly Merge will see them that way. Mm-hmm. I wonder if you had a warder... Who lost his eyes to die, or who at least lost who lost his bond, who was became unbonded, if he would still get visions to men's eyes. That's a good question. Probably not. I think not. No. Yeah. I mean Lands gets passed, so we can't use right. his. Yeah, and, and non channelers certainly can have right. visions, but the the yeah, there's this like m- frequency difference. Yeah. And she can almost tell a channeler just by the frequency. Right. Which is actually something I think she should use more often, but that's a whole other thing. I have to, I have to wonder if a Here's a question for you. Does a channeler hiding their ability to channel change the frequency of men's visions? Ooh. I would think not because for her, the visions get obscured a bit when they're channeling. So is that a way that she could have spotted, for example, Halima? Ooh. Which I know she wasn't even hiding her ability to channel because she was channeling Sidar, not Sidine. Or Sidine, not Sidar. But yeah. Yeah, I don't think so. Could she have used that? Because could she? Could that have been a useful talent for picking out a channel? I think it could have been a useful talent. Yeah, I think that definitely there probably wouldn't be a way to hide that because it's about your soul, right? Like the fact that you are a channeler right. ties you to the pattern in a different way and makes certain prophetic visions about you different. On the other hand, if you're unconscious, she sees nothing. Right, and if you're stilled or gentled, the, the frequency. Right, goes I mean, away. she sees stuff around Loghain, but that's because Loghain has a very specific destiny. But like around. <laughs> but like around Satala or whatever, I don't think she'd see. Well, she never actually meets Satala. Uh, not that I know of. That's a good question. Would she see visions around Satala? Because Satala is clearly very important to a Taviran. So Satala, you think, would have visions around her if men ever looked at whatever, her. Whatever standard visions a human, right, right. normal person would have. Yeah. But yeah, probably not eyes to die grid after 40 years of being still. Even though she is super, even though technically, you know, she is the one who is no longer. Like, yeah, we, there's actually a vision about her. <laughs> about her, yeah. But probably not a vision when looking at her. Yeah. Particularly not after she'd helped Matt, you know. Mm-hmm. I bet that if Min had been in Ebu Dar, she would have seen all kinds of interesting visions around Satala. That there is a village burned in Murindy, and I believe that is the White Cloaks. Doing the whole lion in the grass terror, terror campaign kind of thing? Last yeah, last we saw, Pedro Nile sent the White Cloaks and Caradin out to Andor and Murindi to basically act like Dragon Sworn and so chaos. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's still going on, right? Because Nile hasn't been assassinated yet. So yeah, that's absolutely what that is. The comment where they see the village and are thinking about how crappy it is. The the repeating line, "Who would be a soldier?" I gotta feel like that. That's RJ being like, "No, seriously, war is not glorious." It really, really yeah. isn't. Burned villages are nothing it's to really write not. home about. No, and he's seen them. Exactly. Like, every time I read this with more and more context about his military service, it's like, he says who would be a soldier twice in, like, one page worth of text. And then we have we have Vannon's introduction. Yes, with all of the fat phobia and everything. It's great. 
Okay, so here's where my take on Vannon. Vannon is a red herring for Demondred. Ah. Because the last time we saw a character who was exceedingly fat and yet very light on their feet, it was Kylie. Oh, shit. You're right. I never, well, I very barely ever thought that right at the first. And so there, there was a lot of theories about Vannon mm. out there. And I think mo- as the Mondred, and I think a big part of that was, you know, obviously we know there's a ton of Forsaken near our main characters. So, like, we're all looking for potential Forsaken. Mm-hmm. And he is this guy who, as improbable as it seemed, he could write anything ever born. That does sound like And wouldn't that make more sense? Yeah. Or, like, maybe he's not actually fat, Mm -hmm. right? That's why the horses are able to move so easily, is he's just using the one power to mask his fatness and make himself look fat to cover up who he actually is. Just the way Lanfear did with Kylie. I really like that. I can't believe I never thought of that. I I guess I just bought his Mm -hmm. story hook, line, and sinker. The way he gets introduced over the next page. Right, and also his introduction is really sketchy. But you're right. That's a very distinct pattern. That's really distinct. Mm-hmm. And yeah, the last time we saw it, it was fucking land here, which is like, eh. Mm-hmm. This is like a way more subtle red herring than uh, Tame ever was. <laughs> right, right. But I, what I love is this book is all about where the hell is Demond mm-hmm. Red? And it's like... Is he here? Is he there? Is he there? Could he be this person? Could he be that person? We don't know. You don't know. Jordan might not know. Like, <laughs> at this point, he may not have made up his mind. Like, don't you know, uh, he he could be Taim. He could be Shavannon. He could be off in Shara the way Grendel is pointing Yeah, to. I mean, we that's definitely know. the least likely, but you know. <laughs> well, you know, what are the chances that Brandon Sanderson adopts that? <laughs> no, I I love that. That's that's awesome. Mm-hmm. And now suddenly I'm slightly less annoyed at the persistent fat phobia surrounding Vannon. Because if it is there as this uh, red herring detail, then it's not just meaningless noise, maybe. Yeah, I always thought it was like a cover-up for him being uh, potentially somebody else. Which is why I think the whole Fael thinking he was a dark friend stealing the Horn of Valir... Uh, worked for me. Uh huh. Because you're like, well, maybe even after well, all maybe. this time. <laughs> mm-hmm. And the whole thing about like, oh, the Mondred's stirring up an army. Well, Shavannon's sort of, you know, head of the hand of the band of the Red Hand. Like he's there to take over. Like he's mysteriously disappears and reappears with whatever information. Like I'm just saying, I if if I didn't know better, I would make a could make a damn good argument that Vannon uh, was Demondred. I love that so much because I, I've read this series how many times and I've literally never even really thought that. And now I'm looking at Vannon all anew, even though I know he's not Demondred. <laughs> the argument's so good that I'm like, wait, did I miss something? Maybe he was like, uh, you know, Demondred you know, <laughs> for a brief period of time. Or... Yeah, he actually like, hid the real Chell but... Vannon to the side. Mm-hmm. And... But I'm telling you, it's as good an argument as the Taim. Oh, totally. Uh, it totally is. It totally is. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's great. I love that. Because, yeah, you're right. This is the book where we, all we do is wonder where Demondred is. And then this guy shows up mysteriously. Oh, my God. That's so genius. It makes Vannon's worship of Elaine so much more um, entertaining, too. <laughs> if you imagine he might possibly be Demondred. <laughs> oh. Oh, that is funny. That he's just there, like... He's like, ooh, I can keep an eye on Elaine. She's close to the Dragon Reborn. Yeah. I'm telling you, I can make a, I can make a great argument for why Bannon is Demondred and the like, true... Like, so convinced. <laughs> and so then we come to the next big mystery of this chapter, oh, which yeah. is, who, who killed the Tinkers? Tell the Dragon Reborn what? What? Yeah, that's... I did some Googling. Oh, good, because I did some pondering. Googling told me nothing. Yeah, pondering told me same. Okay, so I also did some pondering. <laughs> lay it on me. And here's a, here's a couple of facts that I'm going to lay out, and, and uh, feel free to, to, to disagree. The horses are all gone. The tinkers are beheaded. Matt is then makes camp when he discovers this, and is attacked by Aiel, who were gatewayed in. Everything, I couldn't find anything to tell me the Aiel weren't just dark friends. Shido, possibly, but dark friends. They don't, they're not the Red Veils because they have their veils up when they mm-hmm. attack. So they're not from there. Okay. 
What does this mean to me? The fact they were gatewayed in tells me that there's a Forsaken involved. The fact that the Tinkers were beheaded tells me it's not Aiel that beheaded the Tinkers. Aiel used spears, not swords, or axes. They wouldn't behead anybody. They'd stab them. Where are you saying that they're beheaded? Because I never caught that, and I feel like you're making a powerful argument, and I want to be, like... Because the one was able to scrawl in blood, so he wasn't beheaded. I think I may have misread that. Heaped corpses? Yeah, I think I read heaped as beheaded. Somehow my brain made that... And I never got that there's no horses. Would they have had horses? I'm so... Yeah, they do have the dogs. The dogs are killed in a line along with the men. They're they're just, uh... And they're they're bar- they're not designed to attack. They're barking dogs only. The horses are. Go- How were they all killed? Are they killed with arrows or axes or swords? Or- that, that I couldn't find any. He doesn't describe it. All right. So the attackers had come from the west first. Most of the men and older boys lay there, mingled with what was left of a number of large dogs, hmm. as if they had tried to form a line. Heaped corpses showed where they had run headlong into the second attack. So the, the women and children fled to the one side, and then there's heaped corpses. So there's, like, an attack on one side, the women and children flee, they get pinned on the other side. Yeah, so it's almost like the enemy was playing with them. Mm-hmm. All right. So the lack the lack of beheading does put a hole in it, because it could be Aiel, then, that did the killing. And there is this group of Aiel that Matt doesn't recognize. Yeah. By the way. Yeah. However, I think the horses were taken to feed the Trollocs. Uh and they left the human bodies because... It, As a warning. Right, and also to maybe hide the fact that it's Trollocs, right? If the horses right. are gone, it could be because brigands want to sell horses. If the bodies of humans are gone, that there's less options for that. Right, right. So, But I think the horses are gone to feed Trollocs. I think the Trollocs were brought in by a way gate to do the slaughter. The slaughter happened to get Matt to stop in a place where they know he would stop so that... Samael can gateway in uh, assassin dark friend Aiel. Because he knows the spot or the area yes. well enough. I know they say you don't have to know the area, but like you have to have at least like know where you're going, right? You have to have some idea of Rain can't just randomly be like, I want to appear wherever Samael is. Like he right, can't do that. Right. He has to know the room. So like I, I feel like this is Samael saying, Okay, I know the slope that they're gonna camp on and I can exactly. gateway you in exactly. to that spot. Mm-hmm. I really like that explanation because so much of this entire sequence the attack this attack on the tinkers and the attack on matt i've never been able to make either one really make sense aside from death and destruction and the dark one but to have the two of them be part and parcel of the same thing ties that up very neatly (laughs) right and you got samael sitting in tears seeing this army coming at him that's very visibly coming at him that was like you know portrayed their them leaving Kyrian with bells and whistles and we're like, yeah, we are coming for you, Samael. Like, he is knows yeah. they're coming. And so he would be the one who would gateway in the assassins, clearly. But how would he know where they are? Well, he set up this murder scene ahead of time so that Matt would stop and assess and be in a predictable location. And of course it would be Trollocs that had to do the killing because nobody kills the tankers. To right. massacre an entire caravan of tankers takes some pretty hardcore evilness. I I bet even Dark Friend Aiel would have a exactly. hard time. You'd need like Red Veil killing Aiel tinkers. to do that. Right, right. Probably even regular run of the mill Dark Friends would would hesitate at the wholesale massacre of Tinkers. Aiel in particular are going to have a real hard time killing. Yeah, tinkers. I don't buy that a Dark. Like, I mean, a Dark Friend would kill themselves, you know, first, even though they're a Dark Friend, right? A Dark Friend Aiel would. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a tough one. Which because like the idea of dark friend Aiel is so alien because their yeah, their honor yeah. is so important. Like it's like how do you even? I I don't I don't understand how you can survive. How you can obey Jito Agreed. and be a dark friend. Like those two seem to be incompatible with each other. This is my reassemble: is that they're they're related. It's all plot by Samael to get Matt to stop in a certain place to send the. And of course, back. Samael would be the kind of cruel, cold, calculated to say who's the nearest victim that will make. Cawthon, stop. A band of tinkers? Sure. Sure. No problem. And then the message would tell the Dragon Reborn Trollocs are... Yeah, tell the Dragon Reborn that there are Trollocs in the Southlands somehow. Right. And that message didn't get finished, and so Matt continues stumbling forward, not knowing that Trollocs could come pouring out of any bush. Exactly. So, my best theory, feel free to poke holes in it, feel free to to push back on me on that, but that's the only thing I could... that, that made this whole 
scene come together for me in a way that brings this chapter together without being just a series of unfortunate events. I'm nodding. Uh, just more of the thoughtfulness of soldiers dealing with civilian casualties. Just because a man had seen death did not mean he had to enjoy it. The quiet over the camp, lack of boisterousness, lack of partying, because the entire army catches wind of, of what happened and what was seen. And uh, that's just, you know, more of the there's good war and there's bad war. There are distinctions kind of thing. I also got to imagine they're pretty damn tired after walking more <laughs> than too. 40 miles a day for the last 11 days. <laughs> like, damn. Yeah, that's true, for sure. <laughs> like, not, not a lot of extra energy for, because uh, that's like, what, 40, it's like 400, it's nearly like 440, 500 miles they've walked. It's a lot of miles, for sure. So yeah, that plus depressing news at the end. Oof. Yeah, yeah. That's like walking, what, halfway up the coast in 11 days? Uh... That's more. Am I being crazy? The coast, man, I used to know exactly how many miles along the Oregon coast was. I think it's only like 500 miles. Just yeah. the Oregon coast? I was thinking the whole uh, Oh, oh okay. Coast. Um, it's a lot more than a few hundred miles for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, that's it's a lot. Because I know it's 3,000 miles coast to coast. But I actually don't know the vertical coast I length. I think I used to. Well, that's not helpful. Is it? You know what? It makes you impressed with my my knowledge of things. <laughs> I have approximate knowledge of many things. About eighteen hundred miles. I oh, know that's the U.S. West Coast. Yeah, U.S. West Coast. We're not including Canada or all of South America. Yeah, okay, no. so eighteen hundred miles. Okay, so they were walking like a quarter of that. Yeah, it's a long way. Mm-hmm. But they hey, just but, you know, days. RJ puts an entire page of description in here about how there's a special kind of quiet. When this sort of atrocity is what the army finished the day on. And then Matt thinks about his spear, the older memories of older dead, and the, the memories, and gets all into that. I notice here he looks at the constellations. Yeah, I have them marked out. Do you think those are the same as ours? No. No, they, they change in just a few thousand years, and people like to seek patterns. I think that with all the turnings of the wheel and everything, I think these have to be mostly very much different from ours. Though, the Hay Wayne has to be the Big Dipper, right? Right. You got the cup. And three... I mean, I feel like... You got the archer, which could be the the snake. Like, there's so many... You could... I mean, the thing is, our, our constellations are like, here's five dots. Make a whole exactly, animal out of it. Yeah. Like, there's a lot of constellations yeah. with the same star patterns, right? Right. But I'd like right, to think that right. the traveler with her staff is Orion. <laughs> but okay. I honestly, I mean, with what little I know about how the sky changes relatively quickly to human civilization, I think that these are all completely different, totally different skyscape. But I also have no problem with the drinking game involving pin the constellation on the name or the, pin the name on the constellation. That's fine, too. Well, and as we, as we know, this is sort of a weird cyclical time, so you can't have like... The constellations have to be the same in every rotation, right? That's true. And the expansion of the universe means that the world has to not expand forever. Otherwise, there wouldn't be constellations. Right. Right. Yeah, no. Jordan's version of cyclical time, definitely, like, what we know about the expansion of the universe and dark energy. Yeah, we just... Nope. And, like, it doesn't work. <laughs> nope. <laughs> it's just like, hmm. Well, that's not Earth. Yeah, RJ just wrote Hubble and everything Hubble. Uh, studied and wrote about out of his cosmology. <laughs> it's like, no, Edwin Hubble never happened. <laughs> Everything he said is lie. Which, I mean, that is the premise of the universe, right? His universe is the wheel of time. Very right? Like, really, that, if there's anything that's a premise of his book, it's that time is a wheel and doesn't have a beginning and an ending and that the expansion of the universe is not a permanent thing. And like, yeah, I get why, like, okay, it doesn't work, but it's magic. Yeah, it's it's such a huge just excisement of reality that it's like, okay, sure. I'll just jump over that gap. It's fine. We'll just, we'll just assume time is cyclical and, and move Yeah, on. so in that regard, these definitely could be all constellations that we could find throughout the last few hundred years mm-hmm. of star pattern seekingness. That's what I was thinking. That was my argument that these are our, our constellations and he just renamed them for the Wheel of okay, Time. Okay, so Oops. do you have a, a match for all of them? No, because I don't know constellations in the slightest. I don't know them as well as I should. (laughs) Maybe the shield is like the Southern Cross or something. 
<laughs> right, right, something like that. The five sisters is probably the the Pleiades because there's seven Pleiades, right? So I'm thinking the five sisters is probably an alternate version of the Pleiades where you only see five. I'm fr- I'm shrugging. I don't know. So I've got some brownies Ooh, here. Though, I sure. made I super super dank brownies the other day. So good. So as he's looking up at the stars, something catches his mm-hmm. ear, which we know is the sound of either a gateway opening or the ropes being sliced by the gateway opening. Yeah, yeah. It's more like the impact of the gateway opening than the gateway itself but Mm -hmm. yes and he doesn't see a flash of light but i'm assuming that's because his eyes just weren't pointed in the right direction because maybe they they could have had the lights off or something well no i'm saying the gateways they produce light right oh that is an excellent point i did actually read an article arguing about that that uh he should have seen a flash of light. Yeah, I feel like that's a bit of a plot hole here because it's supposed Mm -hmm. to be sneaky sneaky but you just flashed like a thousand watt led I mean, it's on the back of the tent, so maybe the tent's between him and... Yeah, and it's really quick. I don't think that... Well, no, the edges of gateways do glow, right? They glow, I'm thinking yeah. of the, the fan art of Matt kicking the golem into the back of Beyond. So... So, I mean, my kind of argument is the Forsaken know how not to make gateways flash. But they know how to do night mode. <laughs> yeah, like... That seems like a pretty simple fix if you, like, really understand the flows. To be like, oh, yeah, we can just, like... Yeah, put, like, a a light dampening thing on it. Yeah, okay, yeah. Right. Uh, We can just hand wave some Forsaken knowledge on that, Mm -hmm. sure. Exactly. In the same way that they can invert their weaves and hide their ability to channel, like, the ability to hide the flash of a gateway seems relatively insignificant. You know, they can do the whole bell before they show up. Yeah. So clearly they can affect the physical area around where they're going to show up. That makes a lot of sense, actually. That's not even hand-waving. That becomes borderline canon. Like, they can make a a doorbell. Surely they can also make the light not show up. It's just an extra line of code. I mean, an extra thread in the weave. Right. Yeah. The the amount of coding that... The parallel between weaving and coding, like... (laughs) And in a lot of ways, like, weaving uh, or knitting... And, like, building a computer chip have a lot in sure. common with, like, the physical process of building up layers repeatedly to, like, in, in a pattern that produces some it's sort true. of I mean, meaning. you can literally knit punch cards. <laughs> Not the best material for communicating program, but you can do it. No, and I, I feel like I've seen, um, like, if you do, like, ones and zeros as two mm-hmm. different colors. Yeah. You could, like, literally, like, program each loop as a different, like, bit. And yeah, I feel like I've seen some pretty cool art projects of, like, this is such and such a document in binary in knitting. <laughs> This is the Declaration of Independence. Right, in binary, exactly, it, exactly. Yeah. Trippy stuff. Like when Elaine talks about exact uh, identical. Oh yeah, matrices. I know that line is My, such a computer mm-hmm. speak sort of line. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh god, Teron Gray all are just computers for the one power. That's how they do what they do. You just program stuff in instead of like writing it on the fly. Yeah. <laughs> so Talmanis comes wandering up to the tent, drunk as well. First of all, Matt hears something hides and sees the Aiel come out. And they're veiled, which means we know they're not the red-veiled Aiel, because the red-veiled Aiel will take their veils off to kill. Mm -hmm. And what a stroke of Tavirin luck that Matt was too restless to sleep in his tent that night. Uh Uh-huh. Because otherwise, none of this would have worked. Well, and that that is by 100%. Yeah, this is just quintessential. (laughs) Right. This This is plot armor coming out and, like, keeping him out of the tent at the right time. Yeah. Precisely. It's almost, like, annoying. It's so blatant at this point. <laughs> there is, and there is a point where he starts, I think after this, he never ends up sleeping in the same tent again. He always, like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Hi- hides where he sleeps from now on uh, because of this exact problem. Yeah, I think it takes one more assassination attempt before he does that. I think this mm. is just the one where he gets the, the ditch and the palisade, and then... Oh, because I, I thought here at the end he's like, oh, well, that's not going to work because he realizes it was a gateway. Yeah, he realizes it won't work, but he doesn't tell anyone his fix for it. I believe that he comes mm-hmm. up with the I'm sleeping in a different room every night plan after uh, Lopin gets killed. Is it Lopin or Narum? I can't remember which one of them gets killed. It's it's an Elysian's body servant. He ultimately gets killed and that and matt thinks that oliver got killed at the same time then it turns out he didn't and that's when he's like screw it i'm not sleeping gotcha. with ever again but this is the night he should have thought of that this was his first warning <laughs> he should have gotten that message but he doesn't quite get it until a few more few more books tomanis is about to run into them and you know let's be honest like if matt had done the smart thing 
he would have let Telmanis get mm-hmm. killed and that and let that be the warning. Yep, but because it's Matt. <laughs> but because it's Matt, a man could get killed in there. That was pure Matt Cawthon. Yeah, it's burn you. I needed two strides. But does he take those two strides? No. Nope. Nope. Of course he does the honorable, brave, stupid thing. And he has no hesitation about pulling back once he has backup. Sure, sure. But he's not a hero. He's no know, bloody he's there hero. To him on. Yeah. He just does what he has to do to protect his friends. You know, in the middle of the battle, I should have run when I had the chance. I should have kept my bloody mouth shut. He found breath again. <laughs> rally, you pigeon gutted <laughs> sheep stealers. Are you all deaf? Clean out your ears and rally. He should have kept his mm-hmm. mouth shut. Mm-hmm. It's like, mm. again, it's very much naive, uh, you know. The, the the hypocriticalness there is on display in a way that is for the betterment of the character. Yes. <laughs> Normal, and that's that's I guess what I love about Matt and Nynaeve is all these other characters are hypocritical in so many other books in a bad way. They're hypocritical in a good way. I get it. This is one of the chapters where you get to see the awesomeness of RJ's technique with the hypocrisy. He's really showing you this is how I'm developing the character. This is how it feels to be this character because you're seeing the outside and the inside of their process at the exact same time. Right. Yeah, he, he does that so well, especially with Matt. <laughs> it's funny, too, when I was reading this scene, I always, for some reason, when I think back on this scene, I thought that it was Nelesian that came up the hill. And then was reading it tonight, and it's mm, Talmanis. Was... Which, like, honestly, of the three commanders, I feel like Talmanis is the least likely to insist on Matt getting drunk. Because he's the stiffest and the most reserved, and you don't know if he has a sense of humor. Like, I, for some reason, rereading this tonight, I was really surprised that it's Talmanis who's concerned with getting Matt Blackout drunk. I mean, Talmanis is one of the most empathetic. Yeah, but we don't know that for books and books, or so I thought. <laughs> or so, or so I you thought. thought. Yeah. No, he's always, this is, he is suffering because of the death of the Tinkers. Yeah, it's just, I. I love Tom Honest later. You know, I really love what Brandon Sanderson did with him. You know, I love the way that Matt and his relationship develops over time. I didn't realize the seeds were planted so damn early. Oh, they're so early. Yeah, no, going back, and again, having finished it and seeing how awesome Tom Honest is, you go back and you read it, and there's, like, the joking is there, the empathy is there, the, the skill is there, like, all from the very beginning. Tom Honest is is a leader of the pack, and, like definitely one of matt's good friends good supporters and just a great all-around character like if you pay attention then that's the thing is like what the the thing that sanderson does differently than jordan is he's got this great character of telmanis and with sanderson you've got a great character you know he's going to show you the great character Mm -hmm. with jordan he's got a great character and you're like wait is that a great character? Yeah. Holy shit. That dude's doing awesome. Like, you really have to, like, see him in the background. He doesn't point it out to you. Yeah, even to the point that when you look back and you think you know the characters, you will misremember because they're that mm-hmm. subtly layered into each other. Again, reasons I love doing this yeah. podcast is really getting in there and scraping those details it's out of the It's so corners. good. That's so good. So, and he gets out of there. I like how Maz, like, gets out of there as soon as, like, it's clear it's handled and everyone's like... It's good that you deprive them of their, their goal. And he's like, yeah, that's what I was doing. Not just getting the fuck out of there as soon as possible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was purely strategic. Strategic retreat to the rear. <laughs> that's what that was. Right. And he assumes that they're Shido Aiel. I honestly don't think they are. Yeah, I, I think they're uh, Shadow Runners, not Shido. Sure. Right. Right. Because we haven't had the whole full box situation Correct. with... That's post Demo. So levels. he hasn't visited the Shido at all. Exactly. Yeah. Although he does talk to them a little bit before Dumai's Wells. Right. Wells. But the, the scattering to the four corners of the earth is in response to Dumai's Wells after. fallout. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. So at this point, I don't think that he would have a lot of those troops. I think he just most likely has just Shadow Runners. Dark yeah, Friend, I, I, I think so. And I'm assuming it seems like he kills all of them. The entire team gets oft <laughs> 12 i yield dead twice as many of that uh killed from the band and then twice that again injured <laughs> so you got 24 dead and 50 injured mm-hmm. so that's 75 casualties to take yeah. out a dozen i yield yeah mm-hmm. that's some um, pretty badass troops right there yeah oh yeah 
Yeah. And just in case Those you are... forgot how badass the Aiel are, 12 of them just took out 75 one way and another. Right, right. I mean, ho- hopefully... Does Matt have any Aes Sedai with him? No. That's part of the end of this chapter okay. is him deciding to go seek out the Aes Sedai for healing. Because they don't have gotcha. any. Gotcha. Right. He definitely should, but that doesn't happen until after he's met up with Saladar and Egwene as yeah. Omerlin. We haven't gotten to the point where Perrin has his pet, Ashamon, and Matt no, has his pet, Aes no. Sedai yet. That's later. Yeah. When the, when the Aes Sedai really... <laughs> when the Aes Sedai really go from being this, like world running for us to oh everybody's got their own guys to die you gotta catch them all yeah totally collect all seven ajas <laughs> my red beats your blue <laughs> jesus tavir and just sweep up uh the eyes to die and a bunch of other powerful people around them as well but uh yeah it's just just they get caught the eyes to die get caught up in tavir and twisting it, it, the tavir this is much more powerful than the eyes to die ability to channel Quite. Quite. Mm-hmm. Especially when you got Rand and these other two incredibly powerful Aes Sedai. Or, uh, Jesus, Tavirin. Yeah, it's not just any Tavirin. It's the Tavirin that save all of reality. Right. It's the Tavirin. It's not a Tavirin, it's the Tavirin. <laughs> so there's a fight. Uh, Matt Matt gives him the sort of, you're going to be a Ro- uh, Roman camp forever orders, and they're like, what? But that's basically what Romans mm-hmm. did, is the whole Palisade thing. Although they didn't also march 40 uh, miles a day. The combination may be slightly unrealistic. Slightly. But slightly. overachieving engineering is very Roman. Very Roman. So he investigates and figures out that the, basically there was a gateway in into mm-hmm. his tent. After he makes in that the Palisade's not going to do him any good. Yeah. And he's like, great. <laughs> I just set up a plan that's already broken. Lovely. And while he's investigating, Oliver no. is basically comes poking around and nearly gets his ass uh, cut in half. Yeah, he definitely nearly gets his skull split for him. Right. It's a very Oliver thing to do to announce himself to Matt by nearly getting himself killed by Matt's killer reflexes. It's a very, very excellent way for Oliver to reintroduce himself. <laughs> Well, you know, Oliver's going to be the hero uh, yeah. of the Fourth Age, I think. He's going to be... Yeah, he's not Geidel, but uh, he is definitely destined for epic setting the stage for the Fourth Age legends. First hero of the age kind of thing. Although I do wonder if he's ever going to be able to get over his, I, his hate of the Shido and the Aiel. <sighs> you know, I bet that he doesn't. I bet that with the way that the Aiel and the Shan Chan and the Westlands or Eastlands really, I, I bet that the three, four, five way war that develops over decades, I bet that his hatred of the Shido is able to stay alive and well. Because there's Shido like running around everywhere at the end of the fourth age. Some of them are trying to get back to the way, or some, at the end of the third age. Some of them are trying to get back to the waste. Some of them are trying to do whatever they're doing in the wetlands like there's going to be a lot of shadow for oliver to have a lifelong revenge pact for at the same time he was exposed to avienda who didn't like the shadow either <laughs> well that's what i'm curious is like is he just gonna hate the shadow is he gonna hate I- all aiel is he gonna have a redemption arc and like come to fall in love with an aiel that would be fun uh, now i bet he totally royally messes up a critical like negotiation with some narrow-minded mm. need to get revenge and that's like why the pact of the griffin falls apart or something like that you know he's a good guy and you're rooting for him the whole time but he also makes all the wrong decisions because of his hate for the shido sorry oliver i'm throwing oh, you under the bus gosh. but i think you're the anti-hero of the fourth age clearly ouch you're making him the slayer of the fourth no, age it's more the luke like the Gawain. Oh, I feel so oh, bad come for saying on. that. No, <laughs> no, not Oliver. Oh, you can't go with Oliver. Fail fire. No, no, <laughs> no. It's probably not that bad. Ah, oh, I mean, can we at least go with like a Noel or a like uh, Jane Farstrider? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. A Farstrider. So wait, wait. You're saying he needs to yeah. betray Malkir? Mm. Oh well. That could be part of the whole revenge on Shido thing. Mm. That, like, he, in order to get revenge, he betrays his principles, and that oh, causes the... yeah. Yeah, I just, I really feel like Oliver is too cheerful and wonderfully well set up to have a happy story to actually get it. It has to be just tragic comedy of errors. 
I like that he, when blows over the wall says he becomes another alcoholic former child star. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. He gets all of Matt's gold oh, and blows God. it on cocaine. <laughs> cocaine and serving girls. Yeah. Uh-huh. With yeah. big bosoms. Yes, bosoms. The roundest eyes. Mm. Uh-huh. <laughs> Huge tracts of land. Huge. There's a pop culture reference I can actually keep up with. It's hardly pop culture. Cult culture? Honey. I was going to say pop it's... culture? Maybe 20 years <laughs> ago. <laughs> Maybe 30 years ago. <laughs> Look, I'm really, really from a cult. I grew up under a rock. Don't mind me. At least there were books under there. <sighs> yeah, there was a really good library under the rock, for sure. But it's one of those things where, like, people of my generation are losing it, right? I keep being online and people that are roughly my age are, like, not getting it about Monty Python. And it hurts because I'm not even that hardcore of a fan. So, anyway. When did it come? 1975 was when that movie came out. So thank you for the 45-year-old reference there. <laughs> really appreciate that. Topical for a podcast right now. <laughs> Monty Python is always relevant. No one expects the past Inquisition <laughs> unless they're white cloaks. Because that's all the white cloaks are is just the Spanish yeah, Inquisition. it's true. So Oliver shows up, and I really feel like this is the assembly of, like, Matt's band of the Red Hand family, the sort of concerned older gentleman who's stitching him up, the young kid Oliver, Talmanis making jokes in the background. Like, this to me feels like we finally have, like, the family of the Red Hand. Yeah, I like that. And I like that Oliver gets re- recruited into the band in a very quintessentially Matt way, because Matt is just trying to, like, save face in front of him and take his mind off the pain of being sewn up. And so it's a very random interaction. You know, he, like, tries to give Oliver some gold just to be nice. And Oliver's like, no, I'm not a beggar. So Matt's, like, trying off the top of his head to come up with something. And that is how Oliver gets recruited, adopted, encompassed by the band. His path is set on to become the next horn sounder. And it's because Matt is fumbling around randomly trying to, like, negotiate a a 10-minute experience. I also really like the items in Oliver's purse because early on, don't we see Matt pull a purse out and he's got like a hawk feather in it and some stones and some like, he has a whole collection of sort of junk like this. Yeah, he does. I think we see that with Rand too. At one point, Rand turns out his pockets and then at a different point, Matt looks through his bag or something. Yeah, we've seen this litany of cool shit that a boy might pick up before. And so I really do feel like this is sort of like coming full circle where Matt is looking back at what sort of his youngest, younger version of himself. Yeah, they bond over a turtle shell. Like, yeah, Uh yeah. And also, this is the board game of Snakes and Foxes. Or cloth game. It's not really a board. But, well, you know, cloth board. It's still a board game. I I play chess right, on yeah, the Okay, board. so yeah. Um so this is the board that like every single member of the band plays an ungodly amount of games of snakes and foxes with Oliver on this board. And this is also the board mm-hmm. that he's playing on when the rescue of Moraine goes down. This is the board that plays that beating game, the winning game. Which is kind of why the opening of this chapter where he's juggling the stones of a red, a blue, and a clear green, and the other ones are striped in interesting ways, makes me think mm. Matt, Moraine, Tom, and Noel. Noel going to rescue. Because that, that, and, you know, maybe a little, and maybe the other two are Noel and Oliver. Uh-huh, because um, those, yeah, there's a lot of ways to slice that, but you're right, there's gotta be a meaning. There just has to be. We're headcanoning it. We're headcanoning <laughs> it, there is meaning. I'm headcanoning it. <laughs> yes. My my high school English teacher would be proud. <laughs> I've added meaning where there was none. Excellent. <laughs> That's how you know we're like extremely posh. And so yeah, he 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 says like, uh, well, I need a messenger, and that's why I'm giving you this gold, not because you remind me of my younger innocent mm-hmm. self. I'm not nice. I'm paying you for reasons. She's exploiting child labor. This is super selfish. So and this whole time he's getting stitched up. So yeah, leave yes. one of my favorite quotes near him. That's a leg, not a bloody side of beef. As my lord says, Nira muttered, my lord's leg is not a side of beef. Thank you, my lord, for instructing me. 
<laughs> Thank you, my lord, for instructing me. For instructing me. My lord is not a side of beef. the best lines of the entire series. <laughs> my lord's leg is not a side of beef. <laughs> Thank you, my lord, for instructing me. Nerev is so underappreciated. <laughs> and you just see him rolling his eyes as he's continuing to stitch. Oh, it's such a deadpan like... line. <laughs> well, the kid is, like, totally, it's, like, way over Right, he's not head. quite sure, like, where the sarcasm starts and the actual threats are. It's uh -huh. like, hmm, hmm, hmm. <laughs> Yeah, it's a really, really cute moment. And you're right, it's a very... It brings the family of the band together. We have our entire cast. I mean, minus Lopin and plus Milesian. But roughly speaking, we have the family of the band assembled here. In this tent, even. <laughs> and, and and they go on to, you know, it, Abu Dhar becomes their home. And right, and right. Like but that, this but... is this is where we have the names and the basic relationships worked out. And that's one of the things I love about Matt is he very much creates an adapted adopted family for himself before unlike the other two boys who very much create actual families for themselves mm. matt goes out there and adopts a family for himself before and he's like i don't want to get married i just want my I, I, but he still wants a family and he still has he takes care of a child who needs taken care of you know he has people that takes care of take care of him he's like anyway it's a little bit of a stretch I but like I, I like that. his I like that Matt's story is very much about the power of chosen family to be just as important as your quote unquote real family, right? Like Perrin very much recreates the family that was taken away from him. Rand, I don't even know how to quantify Rand, but Matt very much does not try to make family, but falls in with one in any way. And that's, I mean, a lot of people have to deal with finding their own families far, far afield from where they started. Right? What? No idea what you're talking about. <laughs> so it's nice that Matt Matt's story is able to give so much vitality and potency to to those kinds of relationships. It was always my favorite part of his relationships is like, you know, Satala Ann being sort of like the, the aunt that would always <laughs> pester him and like sorry, Satala Nan being his, his sort of like annoying older aunt who knew what was best for him. You know, Tom being sort of the grumpy uncle who like never who was insisting that he could you know hike in the wilderness <laughs> when he was sick and continue to go and he's got to take him he's got oliver the stubborn kid he's got you know this is a whole family of uh of folks around him um especially like the and then the even game. the Aes Sedai he has the most profound connection with teslin is a red and a bit of an outcast loner in and of herself just among the other Aes Sedai and that's the one he ends up respecting the most out of the, the normal Aes Sedai and not his friends, the Supergirls. Right. Got, well, Teslin's great. We, we'll have to get to Teslin. Teslin's so great, but she doesn't have a lot of friends, like, period. And that and no. yet Matt is one of no. the few people that she really respects. So mm -hmm. that, again, that, that's yeah, what Matt's the good potency at. of, yeah. like, well, we've gone through stuff together and we've had each other's back, so I guess we're friends. And it's fine. <laughs> I don't care who you are. And Matt's ability... To to befriend people who may not have anywhere anyone else to turn to and he sees that and he's like well i'm yeah, there for you a very bizarre mix of selfishness and selflessness <laughs> it's so hard to pin down that's because you can't you can't listen to a word he goddamn says yeah because in his mind he's nothing but selfish and in his actions he's nothing mm -hmm. but selfless and then his mouth just makes crude jokes to <laughs> right well it's like, it's just, his mouth needs to be stapled shut that's a whole nother issue yeah because he'll insult you <laughs> right. insulting you. yes he'll make uh... you wish that he hadn't rescued you because he's so yeah. freaking annoying i've had that friend in college who was like so goddamn smart that he could come in and like oh, i've been working on this problem for like two hours i can't solve it oh you just move this over here and do that and then here's the answer right <laughs> You're so talented. You piss me off sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that is an mm -hmm. entire mood. Happiness that Oliver has finally been adopted. Yeah, like, that's yeah what Oliver. we were just saying was the, the whole adopted our... family. So, Oliver being the youngest and cutest in a strange sort of way. <laughs> uh, the youngest, youngest. Oh. He's the youngest. <laughs> yes, the youngest. And I, I will say the one person who's really missing is Brigida. Yeah, yeah, she's a. Uh... Has not yet gotten here yet. Well, and this is where, okay, just one one thing further on the found family. I always really liked 
um, Matt and Elaine as, like, the annoying mm-hmm. brother-sister. Like, and Brigitte sort of as the older, much older sister than the two of them. Or even, like, and and so the three of them are all siblings sort of mm-hmm. together. Yeah, Matt and Elaine are much closer in age and Brigitte's way older. Yeah. Brigitte being the oldest. Right, right. And they just all give each other a hard time and, like, Brigitte and Matt get along because she's much older and he's the guy. But, like, the and Brigitte gets really along with Elaine, but Elaine and Matt, like, butt heads all yeah. the time. It's... It's a fun familial relationship. RJ there. had a reasonably big family, I would assume, as far as people to model this off of. Yes, yes. Well, and, and he—I've heard him talk, do a lot of talking about s- storytelling on his porch. Uh huh. Uh huh. With his family, and like that was something that he had a very large oral storytelling tradition in his family before he ever put anything down on paper. Is they'd, they'd sit out and, and tell stories and make stuff up. So. Apparently that was something that his whole family did. That makes a lot of sense. I think it shows in all the different voices he's able to bring to these characters that really are not. Sure, that's a good point. I wonder how many of these characters are like are given voices of family members he heard telling stories in his younger days, if that was something his family did together. I would bet so. I mean, my limited experience with families that tell stories to each other as entertainment, you pass the baton. It gets passed around, so. filter? Do you want it in front of you? Do you want it off to the side? Do you want to hear literally every single noise of your mouth moving, or do you want to hear the Mm. entire room that you were speaking in? Right. (laughs) Because those are your options unless you build a fucking studio. Which I will. But for now, I get to hear my room, and I hate it. Yeah, the room noise is something that I'm... You uh, you upgraded your mic, right? You're you're not still using the same mic that I sent you. Yeah, I am. Oh, okay. That's... It... It works on your voice so much better than it does on a male voice. <laughs> it just doesn't pick up the low frequencies of a male voice. Because I pulled it up for, for Travis, and I was like, nope, that doesn't work. Yeah, no, this this one continues to work fine for me. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. I think better since you got me the interface, but... Oh, yeah, the interface does make a big difference, because then you have the amplification. Yeah, for sure. I'm excited to build a studio, though. I'm really, really, like, yeah. I'm going to do it. It's going to be so perfect. I'm so jazzed. <laughs> How much do you need a roommate? To, I, can, I can pay rent. <laughs> you knew how many people have said something similar. Uh, no. <laughs> I bet. Actually, not that many people because I don't have that many friends. But a high percentage of my friends, shall we say. I need to get out of this apartment life just because like, I want to get my brewing set up back up. I want to build a studio. Um, I want a pottery studio. Like... I miss doing something other than sitting in my apartment. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's, it's extremely relatable. Oh my God. <laughs> this is why I'm so angry that the closing date got moved just by a week, but it's like a whole nother week. Well, and then Timber, uh, hasn't had much yard time either. Right. Like I wish, I wish I had a space for him. Like, hmm. Yeah. And then I'm like, Brandon, we can get a dog. We can get a dog. He's like in a year or two. Uh, you need a dog now <laughs> why what's i mean so are you going puppy or are you going well that's that's part of the adult thing is we might if we're gonna get a puppy it's a much bigger run-up i'm yeah. making a very strong argument that he, one of his colleagues is a foster mom for older dogs mm. and so mm-hmm. ever since we learned that about her i'm like so we should totally get our first dog as one of hers like you know, like yes. some big old pit bull that's just like the most adorable, sweet girl that just hangs out. Like Brandon got to see so many sweet dogs at his office before he started doing work from home. So that is a much shorter, less intensive run up. It does come with some intense, intense emotions when the dog inevitably passes right. relatively soon. 
But then the dog gets to teach us how to dog, you know, and like have a dog. And... <clears throat> but that dog knows how you need to own her. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and he and it'll teach you how to own her because it'll be like, no, no, no. You need to feed me now. <laughs> like, I need to walk now. Like, they'll, they'll, they'll make demands because they're old dogs. And... Exactly. So I'm really hoping that that's what we do. So I don't know. We'll see. Somebody is much more excited about committing to things than somebody else in this household, shall we say. I'm What I'm guessing is that he is much more focused on moving right now, and that when moving is done, he will be much more open to things like dogs and other commitments. Yeah, it's been a lot of go, go, go for the past couple of yeah. years with everything. So yeah, it's like, yes, 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 dear, we'll just... We'll wait. One major life decision at a time. Also, I have lists of ideas. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> Although I will admit a dog would be probably number two on my priority list behind moving. Yeah. And I can tell you that honestly because here in Portland, the second I moved into an apartment that allowed me to have a dog, I went and got Timber. Yeah. And when I say the second, I mean less than seven days after we moved our bed into the apartment. I came home with a dog. and. Jessica was not happy. (laughs) (laughs) Jessica, I I, I definitely, I was like, hey, I really want to bring home this dog. And I got that text. It was like, you can do whatever you want, honey. And then I got home and she was like, oh, I didn't think you'd actually do what you wanted. (laughs) Never tell someone that it's fine if they get a dog unless you're okay with them getting a dog. And, and, you know, Timber was always my dog, you know. Yeah. I did all the walking, all the feeding, all the... Yeah. yeah, and he's definitely. She never had any. Never. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, he was. He was definitely my dog. Um, oh, he's such a sweetie. Anyway, he's right now. He's sitting on the bed, being frustrated that we haven't walked. No. Like, nope. It's gonna have to be after the we record, not before. Well, now I've killed my beer, so you can keep giving him reasons to be annoyed while I go fetch another beer for myself. <laughs> that was a good one. I got some nice. A uh, hiss, nice fizz, yes. a good crack. Well cracked beers. A wonder to behold. <laughs> Priorities, guys. You gotta have them. Thank you for listening to the Wheel of Time Spoilers podcast. Rate us in the Apple Podcast app or support us on Patreon. Is that good enough?